Hi, welcome to Mormon Scripture Explorations. Today we're continuing our examination of the Book of Mormon, and uh, we'll be looking at issues and stories related to the translation of the Book of Mormon. Now, a great deal has been written about this. I have a bibliography uh, entitled Translation on my webpage, and the address is listed at the bottom, so if you want to read a lot more, uh, you can look at that bibliography. Uh, just a couple months ago, a book came out by Brant Gardner called The Gift and the Power Translating the Book of Mormon, and it's an excellent study of the topic. It goes into great detail. It's um, lots of references to both primary sources and other studies and so forth, and it's a great examination of all the range of issues relating to the translation of the Book of Mormon. So, what I'm talking about today is just a few of the basics. Uh, it's pretty clear from all of the sources how the Book of Mormon was produced. Now, we're not talking about the golden plates or anything like that. We're talking about the practical day-to-day -day activity that, that produced the book. And basically, Joseph Smith dictated the book word for word to scribes, a number of different scribes, but mainly Oliver Cowdery. So what they would do is, is sit in a room, Oliver Cowdery would write down, and Joseph Smith would speak, just dictate. Oliver Cowdery would write it down. The entire book was produced in about 65 days from April through June 1829. I'll show you some references to where that's been analyzed. Now, this represents for a, you know, four or 500 page book, this is an incredible speed. Uh, and also accuracy, because we need to recognize that whatever Joseph Smith dictated, there were no major revisions. We know this because we have the um, actual manuscript that was dictated and written on for some parts of the Book of Mormon. Most of it's lost, but we do have sections that have been carefully studied, and you can see that it is, number one, written by hand uh, from dictation. You can tell it's from dictation because of the way certain words are heard and written. And you can also tell that there's no revisions because we can compare it to the printed edition. Now, there were changes in grammar, spelling, punctuation, things like that, of course, because you have a handwritten, dictated uh, manuscript with no punctuation in the original. Uh, all that stuff's got to be added in. But there's no major addition of ver uh, verses or chapters or things like that. So it represents an incredible uh, speed of production and incredible accuracy of production. Uh, it's really quite a, a phenomenal feat. Uh, I've written several books and dozens of articles, and I can tell you it requires, the process of writing requires editing and, and rewriting and thinking through and reworking. And for the Book of Mormon, we just have Joseph Smith sitting there uh, dictating word for word. Oliver Cowdery and the other scribes writing it down, and that's it. So that's in interesting in and of itself. If you want to see some, some descriptions of people who either were eyewitnesses of the translation process or who had heard stories about it from other people's uh, who were eyewitnesses, early accounts of what's going on. There's uh, two sources, Welch's article in Opening of the Heavens, on the pages listed there, uh, goes through and gives a, a series of firsthand primary sources that recount different incidents related to the, book of, uh, the, tr the production, the dictating of the Book of Mormon. Likewise, the FAIR uh, webpage has a whole bunch of these. There's several hundred, a couple hundred, I think, and um, you can take a look at those. It's interesting reading just to see what the people who actually were there and saw it and, uh, you know, recounted their, what they saw. Now, um, Joseph himself does not give a lengthy, detailed explanation of how the translation process worked. And that's unfortunate because he's the one who would actually know what was going on. Uh, basically, what he says when he talks about it is that it's just translated by the gift and power of God, by which he means it's revelation. That phrase or variations of it are used in a number of different places. Now, Joseph Smith himself is the only person who really knows how, you know, what was going on in his mind at that time. Uh, Latter-day Saints, of course, believe that there's authentic revelation going on. Uh, it's also possible that he sincerely believed he was receiving a revelation, but was just, you know, the words were coming out from his own subconscious or something, uh, which a lot of uh, non-Mormons think was going on. Uh, but either way, um, the production of the book was quite remarkable. Joseph Smith also 
uh, talks about the Book of Mormon in a famous statement that Latter-day Saints quote all the time. The Book of Mormon is the most correct of any book on earth and is the keystone of our religion. Uh, I've given the references there on the page. The most correct book is sometime under, sometimes understood by people, especially anti-Mormons, to infer that it is, it is an inerrant book. That is to say that there were no mistakes. Now, Joseph Smith's clearly not claiming that because in the 1837 edition of the Book of Mormon, he went through and made a bunch of changes in spelling and grammatical errors. So he's not talking about, you know, the, the, the printing of the book and that there's no typographic errors or spelling or grammar errors. What he's talking about by most correct means, it's correct in theology and commandments and revelations from God. So we shouldn't conflate this idea that uh, the, the Book of Mormon is the most correct book to mean it's an in inerrant or perfect book. The Book of Mormon, in fact, as we talked about earlier, says specifically that there, there may be errors in the book. It doesn't make that claim. But it does provide a important foundation for theology, doctrine, and commandments, and so forth. We also have the idea that the Book of Mormon is the keystone of our religion, and this is referring, it's an allusion to uh, the keystone of an arch. And basically, what that means is that if you're a Mormon, you're one who accepts the Book of Mormon as Scripture. That is, that's the key thing that sets um, Mormons off from non-Mormon Christians. Mormons accept the Book of Mormon as Scripture, which means they accept Joseph Smith as a prophet. But our name, the name for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the nickname is Mormons, and it derives, of course, from this book. And in my experience, when a person ceases to accept the Book of Mormon as authentic scripture, he basically ceases to be a Mormon. They'll, they'll drift away from the church if they come up with that conceptualization. So Joseph Smith uh, tells us that the Book of Mormon is... Translated by the gift of God, it is revealed, it's a revelation, it's a correct book uh, in terms of the teachings, and it is a keystone, or you could say it's the foundation of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now, there's a number of controversies surrounding the translation of the Book of Mormon, and uh, one of the most important is the use of a seer stone. Uh, within early LDS writings, we see the references to seer stones in a number of different ways. Sometimes it's called a seer stone. Sometimes they're called the interpreters in the Book of Mormon. Sometimes they're called the, the Urim and Thummim, or Urim and Thummim in Hebrew. Some, some uh, writers will call them peep stones, which is kind of a colloquial term for seer stone. Uh, whatever these seer stones are, they're, they're, I think they're related to the white stone that's mentioned in Revelations 2.17. That is, the seer stone is white, the same as the white stone in Revelation. Uh, they're also correlated with the Urim and Thummim, which were apparently stones of some sort that the high priest kept in his ephod in a pouch that he used for divination, that is, for receiving revelation, although the, the Old Testament doesn't provide any details of how this was done. I've got a bibliography on my webpage on um, the bibliography called Translation. You can find a section uh, down a page or two where it gives some bibliography on the Urim and Thummim, and you can see what we have to say about that. What, what seems to have happened is that Joseph Smith had, had a stone or perhaps several stones. He used these stones, he'd look into them, and receive revelation through this. Now, what was really going on of course, is, is a big question. I've never used a seer stone, so I don't know what was happening physiologically or psychologically to Joseph when he used this. Uh, some of the accounts talk about words appearing kind of on the reflective surface of the stone, kind of like a, an iPhone or an iPod, where you know, you've got this flat, shiny surface and your words appear. You see pictures and words and so forth. Some, some of the people who... Uh, were involved with the early Book of Mormon and the early church say that that's what happened. Uh, presumably they get that information from Joseph, but Joseph himself never says that. Anyway, Joseph used this stone. He didn't seem to use it all the time, but he did use it on an occasion. Uh, it's eventually called the Urim and Thummim. I don't think it's called that in the earliest sources. They call it seer stone, generally speaking. Sometimes he's said to have placed it in a hat and, and kind of put the hat over his face 
and then looked at this stone and the people who described this, and you can see their descriptions on those two uh, sources the, that I gave earlier. Uh, the people who talk about this say he did it to, uh, because there was glare on the stone and he couldn't see into it clearly. Just like if you have an iPhone or some type of uh, computer thing and there's lots of glare and reflection, you can't read it. it seems to have been the same sort of thing. Now, why did he use this? Um, I mean, he doesn't really say other than that he used it. Talks about it in the Book of Mormon, the interpreters, as a mechanism for translation. Some people think it might be a spiritual crutch of some sort. That is, Joseph didn't quite believe that he had the capacity to receive revelation, and the seer stone was something that kind of, you know, he could hold in his hand and act as a, as a stimulant to these revelations. Uh, eventually he ceased to use it. I mean, he receives revelations and translations like in the book of Abraham. He never doesn't use the seer stone anymore when he translates the book of Abraham. But at, at this point, he was using it quite a bit with the book of Mormon. Some people think it, it, that uh, it's related to a phenomenon called scrying, which is looking into crystal balls or things like that. Uh, some people think that, um, that, that psychologically you can enter into a kind of semi- hypnotic state, if you stare at a shiny thing or object or a mirror, different things are used and you can kind of enter in a semi-trance uh, by doing that. So that, that by staring into this stone, Joseph is able to block out other sensory uh, data that could interfere and receive revelation more clearly and, and quickly and easily. Um, I don't know. There, you know, possibly all of those things are correct to, to one extent or another. Now, it's interesting that the use of a seer stone for, uh, for the translation is relentlessly mocked by anti-Mormons. They just think this is hilarious. They make great fun of it. You know, what a stupid idiot. He's looking in a stone in a hat to translate the Book of Mormon. Uh, you need to turn the tables on, on people when they make these kind of claims. And ask yourself this question. If Joseph Smith was a fraud... That is, he's a con man, he's trying to, uh, you know, make this book to make money or something. Why would he use a seer stone at all? Remember, he's just making this stuff up. He's a con man, he knows he's making this stuff up. Why use a seer stone? Why put it in a hat? I mean, it's not working, he knows it's not working. It's all fake. Why would he do it? I mean, you know, basically people uh, would mock him for it, as they did, in fact. So it's very interesting that you know, if Joseph is a fraud, there's no reason for him to do this. Uh, and he does it, which indicates minimally that he's sincere, that he really believes that this is, that he's getting revelation to produce this book. Uh, and if that's the case, then the way we interpret Joseph Smith, uh, is, you know, needs to include uh, his utter sincerity in, in what he's doing. So, that's kind of a summary of the, of the process of translating. Where did the words come from? That's the big question. Now, Latter-day Saints, of course, believe that the words are inspiration from God who revealed the meaning of the engravings on the golden plates. It's just straightforward. It's a revelation of the contents of the golden plates, the Book of Mormon. Uh, Non-Mormons tend to believe that it's a phenomenon deriving from Joseph's mind and imagination and cultural environment. That is to say, Joseph's making it up. Now, there's two alternatives within that uh, con conceptualization. One is that he's delusional, that he's sincere. He believes he's re uh, receiving revelation, but it's just his subconscious speaking, automatic writing, something like that. The other is that he's a fraud. He knows he's not receiving revelation. He's, he's running a con game on people for whatever reasons. Uh, the... Critics of the Book of Mormon, the critics of Joseph Smith, need to decide which is it, because those are contradictory and conflicting uh, interpretations of Joseph Smith. So some th say delusion, some say fraud. Uh, there are a few who, who talk about uh, conspiracy with ghost writers, that somebody else wrote it and Joseph Smith was just dictating it or something. Uh, the Spalding manuscript is very common in, in this regard. This is generally discredited now. Most uh, scholars, pro or con, don't think there's ghostwriters behind it. It's either Joseph Smith making it up in a state of delusion or fraudulently, or it's receiving revelation. I mean, those are the, the two 
alternatives that we have. The last issue related to translation is the uh, question of the manuscripts and textual crit uh, criticism. That is to say, figuring out what the original manuscript of the Book of Mormon said and trying to accommodate all the different textual changes that have been made throughout time. Now, all the manuscript evidence, all the different published editions, everything has been carefully studied and scrutinized by a brilliant uh, textual critic named Royal Skousen. He teaches at BYU. I've got the, in my bibliography on translation on my webpage, I've got uh, full bibliographic information about his work on this matter. He summarized all of his conclusions in this volume from Yale, just came out a couple years ago, the Book of Mormon, the earliest text. And basically, he has tried to restore what the text of the Book of Mormon was when it was dictated for the very first time to Joseph Smith. And he includes at the back of this a list of all the major significant changes that have occurred in the Book of Mormon text. So it's a great source to for what we call textual criticism. Most of the time we don't, you know, talk about textual criticism in, uh, within the context of the church, but it can be interesting to help us understand what the Book of Mormon text is really saying. So I'll be referring to some of Skousen's uh, discoveries and interpretations as, I, as we actually get into the book itself. So this uh, basically concludes some of the introductory material. There's lots of things that could, we could say about you know, the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, but that's really more of a issue of, of church history and the biography of Joseph Smith than it is about the Book of Mormon itself. So from now on, I will turn specifically to the Book of Mormon and we'll just move into the text itself and examine it uh, in some detail and try to understand what's going on and look at the context and the implications of what we find in the Book of Mormon. And if uh, you want uh, more information, visit my webpage at mormonscriptureexplorations.wordpress.com. Thanks for listening.